Today's webinar is part of our Variation Series, um, which is based on articles written for our quarterly publication. If you haven't had a chance to read the publication, it just went out yesterday, it can be found on the homepage of our website. The Winter 2017 edition is a joint edition between U.S. Clivar and the Ocean Carbon Biogeochemistry Program. The topic is forecasting info impacts in the California current system, and the speakers were both part of a workshop that was held this past August at Scripps. So now I'd like to welcome our speakers. First up is Emmanuel Di Lorenzo from Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Manu as well as Art Miller were both our guest editors for this edition of Variations. Following Manu will be Mark Oman from Scripps Institu Institution of Oceanography, Antonietta Capitondi from NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, Mike Jaycox from the University of California, Santa Cruz, Clarissa Anderson from Scripps Institution of Oceanography as well, and then wrapping us up will be Elliot Hazen from NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center. So thank you for joining us, and I will pass this over to Manu. Hey, good morning. Um, I hope you guys can hear me well. Uh, so my task is to introduce uh, a little bit uh, this uh, workshop on forecasting ANSO impacts on marine ecosystem of the U.S. West Coast, which was held uh, in La Jolla last August, and here's a picture of some of the participants. Uh, this workshop was organized by uh, several uh, people that are presenting today, which are listed here. And, uh, and also, importantly, uh, we had important sponsors. Uh, which are no longer in this picture, but it's okay, uh, which were U.S. Clivar, NOAA, the OCB program, uh, and also international uh, organizations like PICES, uh, which is the North Pacific Marine Organization, and also ICES, which is the International Council uh, of the Sea. Now, the motiv main motivation behind this workshop was the idea that over the last six years, uh, we have collected uh, a, a wealth of information from, say, sampling programs like Kalkofi or even Lime P in the Gulf of Alaska, and more recently, the Coastal Observing Systems, about how ENSO impacts essentially uh, different uh, components of the marine ecosystem. And so while in the climate community, there is a, there is a, there's been a lot of effort in trying to forecast ENSO, and we have ENSO forecasts available uh, you know, every year, essentially. Uh, can we actually use these to uh, make forecasts also of the marine ecosystems? And so with that said, then, the, the goal uh, of this workshop was to attempt to develop a framework for using these ENSO forecasts, which are available in the climate community, to predict changes in key components of the marine ecosystem along the U.S. West Coast. Now, with that in mind, it became clear that as we try to address this problem, that is the predictability understanding uh, of the marine ecosystem predictability here, uh, we need to focus uh, uh, initially on understanding the predictability of the ecosystem drivers. And what do we mean by that? Uh, so a typical ecosystem driver, uh, in, for example, in a region like the California Current, can be changes in sea surface temperatures, uh, changing in the upwelling strength or nutrient fluxes, uh, the transport, the alongshore and crossshore transport dynamics, and things like lower trophic productivity or oxygen. <coughs> These are all well-recognized ecosystem drivers. <coughs> now, of course, this is very general, and so as part of the workshop exercise, we try to identify which of these ecosystem drivers are really important in driving uh, what we refer to as key ecosystem indicators. Uh, or uh, essentially uh, ecological quantities, which can also be target populations, which are relevant for ecosystem services. And in fact, in, uh, in one of the issues, um, you know, in, in one of the papers in the issue by Mark Coleman, uh, uh, Mark presents a very nice uh, summary table that was developed at the workshop, uh, where essentially we look at uh, several ENSO-related processes that actually act as ecosystem drivers. And this was a very useful exercise uh, because uh, it, it, we were able to identify what we thought were important ecosystem indicators and also the oceanic processes that may drive them. So with that said, then, of course, uh, the next uh, step of this kind of diagram here is to try to understand what are the regional forcing patterns that actually uh, drive these ecosystem processes or ecosystem drivers here. 
And uh, what do we mean by regional forcing patterns? Well, typical regional forcing patterns are essentially the local wind stresses uh, or the wind stress curl, the surface fluxes of heat and, and, and fresh water, and also remote uh, coastally trap waves that enter the domain. And of course, after we identify what are the uh, regional forcing patterns, and keep in mind that, for example, changes in upwelling uh, may be a combination of several regional forcing patterns, and so that's important really to identify those uh, rather than try to develop just a simple index of everything. Uh, once we have these regional forcing patterns, we can then uh, go back and try to understand what are, how the ancillary connections are really impacting and carry predictability in the changes in these uh, regional forcing patterns. So with that said, uh, the strategy for this framework, the first step is to essentially uh, use, for example, regional scale ocean reanalysis uh, to identify uh, what are these regional forcing patterns controlling uh, the U.S. West Coast uh, marine ecosystem drivers. And, uh, and there are two contributions in this uh, Cliver issue that are also talking today by Mike Jacox and Anderson et al. that describe some of these uh, physical and biogeochemical uh, processes that are important. Uh, the second step uh, to, to this uh, problem is uh, the one to essentially use uh, large-scale reanalysis to identify these teleconnections and how the tropical Pacific controls uh, these regional forcing patterns. And here, of course, we are talking about ENSO, but it was clear uh, from the discussion that ENSO has different expressions, and so we needed to kind of take a more uh, broad definition of ENSO, and, and for ENSO here in teleconnections, we mean really any flavor of tropical Pacific sea surface temperature variability that leads to predictable responses in these regional forcing patterns. And in this particular issue, Antonietta Caputondi will discuss some of these dynamics, uh, and I think also in the webinar today. So going back to our framework, once we have created understanding of the physical basis for predictability of these ecosystem drivers, uh, then we can move forward and do the exercise of testing what is the actual predictability or the predictive scale uh, of, of, of these ecosystem drivers. And one step that we identified here was the use of uh, large climate model ensembles like the North American multimodal ensemble to quantify the predictability of these RFCs uh, you know, in, along the U.S. West Coast. Now, this predictability, of course, happens on, in quota, the seasonal time scales because when we, once we have an ENSO developing in the tropics, uh, one could potentially predict up to maybe six months in advance what's going to happen, say, uh, along the U.S. West Coast in these regional forcing patterns. And, and this uh, kind of seasonal predictability could actually be very important and expand on ongoing uh, seasonal predictions that are currently being done using, for example, uh, just the persistent of sea surface temperature anomalies in certain regions. And Tomasi et al. In, in this issue of Clivar variations essentially uh, gives some indication of how these uh, seasonal forecasts that are based on sea surface temperature persistence have been already used to predict large uh, marine ecosystems uh, in different regions. Uh, now, another important thing that we discuss is that if these forecasts are successful, uh, they would actually add tremendous value to uh, ongoing development of modeling tools for real-time management of, of uh, things like top predators and other ecological quantities of interest. And Hazen, in this particular issue and at the end of this webinar, will discuss uh, some of these implications. And to conclude, uh, I also wanted to point out that at the workshop we had representative from ICES and Pisces uh, because uh, there are essentially opportunities to develop synergies with international communities uh, with different working groups that are trying to essentially understand the climate and ecosystem predictability on different timescales and in different regions. And so here I'm, I'm labeling two of such efforts. One is a Pisces working group on climate and ecosystem predictability, which is joint with uh, uh, with Cliver International and is still being developed right now. And another one is uh, an ICES working group that was approved, I think, last year on seasonal to decadal uh, marine ecosystem forecast, uh, which is led by Mark Payne. And also, I think, uh, Desiree Tomazi, if I'm correct. So this is all for the introduction. And now I'll give the the, 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 the voice to, to these other authors that will essentially give more details about these different elements of this framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manu. Excellent presentation. Um, I'll take a moment here just to see if there's any questions um, from any of these Lorenzo. 
Uh, before we go over to Mark, feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat feature. Okay, we'll take that as no questions at the time, and we'll go ahead and turn this over to Mark for his presentation. Okay, thank you, Kristen and Manu. So I'm here on behalf of a number of participants in the workshop, particularly those with biological, ecological, and uh, biogeochemical expertise in the California current system. As Manu made clear, the objective of the workshop was not to develop a physical uh, basis for forecast of the system alone, but rather the living components of, of marine ecosystems and the way they affect a variety of ecosystem services. And my, my purpose this morning, uh, morning my time, is not to, uh, not to uh, summarize all of the, the known ecosystem impacts, but rather to give you a, a schematic framework for some of the key processes that we need to incorporate in forecast models. Now, I think we're at the point where there's the scientific foundation for beginning to develop these, uh, our understanding into a quantitative framework. So here's, if uh, we, yes, there we go. Um, this is just a schematic that illustrates um, some of the processes that we need to incorporate. And uh, we can, of course, think of them as local effects of ENSO and advective effects. I wanted to draw your attention to the three colors of arrows, um, which, ref which indicate the different uh, driving processes. The yellow arrow points to what we think of as direct physiological effects, or rather changes in forcing uh, via winds, altered upwelling, alterations to the heat budget that affect temperature of the water column, calcium carbonate saturation state, dissolved oxygen, that can have direct effects on the physiology of the organisms, on their feeding, their growth, or reproduction. The second major pathway is reflected by the orange arrow, which is how those changes in the water column propagate through the food web. Um, often affecting the uh, local forcing, affecting the thermocline and neutrocline structure, especially the nitrocline, but also the ferrocline, the vertical gradient of dissolved iron, and how those changes can then propagate to upward to affect the rates and composition of the primary producers, and those in turn affecting uh, their consumers, uh, um, a variety of grazers and predators. Now these orange arrows are, are dual-headed, meaning that the uh, changes at the, the top of the food web, up at the, primary produ the secondary producers and beyond, um, that those can propagate downward and alter the composition of the, their prey. And this is what we call top-down effects. But both of those we'd consider food web effects. The blue arrows to the right um, are the direct effects of advection via coastally trapped waves of equatorial origin or other mechanisms that can either um, alter the neutrocline structure and propagate up through the food web in the manner we just described, or to bypass that process and have direct effects of transport processes introducing exotic organisms um, poleward and sometimes, uh, sometimes shoreward. Let me give you a brief example of the processes that I'm referring to. So with respect to the direct physiological effects, this is a classic case of the temperature-dependent response of growth rate of phytoplankton. Growth rate is a function of temperature from Epley's work, and there's, uh, this, these curves are what we call thermal reaction norms. The thermal reaction norms are nonlinear, and there's, they typically have a well-defined optimum. You can see the black arrow at the bottom that defines the temperature optimum. Now, this is for one particular species of phytoplankton. The, if we consider an assemblage of different species, Epley showed that there are uh, pronounced differences among species in these thermal reaction norms and the locations of their temperature optima. So you can imagine that during a, a Nino phase or Nina phase of ENSO, that small changes in, in temperature can have pronounced effects not only on the total rate of growth that leading to primary production, but on the composition of the phytoplankters, the differential temperature sensitivities that change the phytoplankton assemblage, which in, in turn affects their consumers. The second mechanism, um, we described the uh, bottom-up effects. And so let's start with a panel on the bottom, that is the depth of the nitrocline. This is summarized for the Southern California sector of the California current system by Ralph Gerica from the CalCoffee measurements. 
<clears throat> it's a, this is about a 30-year time series, and you see the red vertical lines indicate some of the dominant, uh, the medium to strong ninos during that course of that time. Uh, the time series on the bottom is nitrocline depth anomalies, and you see that in at least three of the four moderate to strong ninos, there was a deepening of the nitrocline, a positive anomaly, 92, 93, 97, 98, less so in 90, uh, sorry, 2009, 10, and then in 2015, 2016. The next panel above that is the nitrate concentration. This is the concentration in the mix layer. And you see depressions in the nitrate concentration accompanying the deepening of the nitrocline. The panel up above that is the average chlorophyll concentration. These are log anomalies. And this is a, a proxy measurement for the concentration of phytoplankton, biomass of phytoplankton. And the biomass was depressed um, at least in three of the four, less so in 2009-10. Uh, okay, so this is a, a key mechanism, and we think we know how to begin quantifying that. Um, a lateral advection that bypasses the, the food web. An, an example is the poleward displacement of this wonderful subtropical krill, Nictiphany simplex. Uh, whose typical distribution, geographic distribution, it's not the whole band that you see there, pink band, but rather what I've put in an oval that is primarily breeding off Baja California from about 25 to 30 degrees north latitude. Now, during the 57-58 El Nino, uh, they were displaced markedly to the north. Remember, the primary breeding down here off Baja California, and they were recorded at least to Cape Mendocino, perhaps further north. The sampling didn't extend further at that time. 1982-83 uh, Nino, uh, we're now, this map scale has, has changed. We're just off the northern sector, off Oregon and Washington. And this subtropical krill was displaced at least as far north as 46 degrees. In the 97-98 Nino, I don't have a map right here at the moment, but they were found at least, they were found to uh, northwest Vancouver Island at almost 51 degrees north. That's over, over 20 degrees of latitude displacement. And 2015-16, the data are not all in, but they were extremely abundant off Southern California, recorded at least off Trinidad Head in Northern California, not recorded as far as report. So this um, poleward advection is very important. But another advective component um, we refer to as habitat compression. And this, uh, this is the onshore, offshore uh, displacement of organisms associated primarily with the changes in upwelling wind forcing. And a uh, very nice example of that uh, given here uh, by the spawning distribution of the Pacific sardine, uh, the panel on the left is the spawning habitat in the Strong Nino of 1998. The vertical black bars are eggs, as sampled by a continuous underway fish egg sampler uh, from the Cal Coffee Cruises. And you see, and oh, sorry, I don't have a scale for the background, but the background is SST, and orange is warm. Um, you see that in 98, the habitat of the, the spawning habitat was compressed very close to the coast. Um, in, a, in a narrow ribbon. In contrast, a year later, in the La Nina of 99, the habitat uh, for the spawning fishes was displaced considerably further offshore into a more uh, typical offshore domain. And this is a key process um, to quantify as well. I want to just <clears throat> mention uh, an intriguing possibility of the non-stationarity of some biotic responses to El Nino. And this is work in progress. But this is a time series over 70 years, uh, and the green line is the detrended San Diego sea level anomaly. When that exceeds the, the upper dashed red line, we consider that an El Nino phase in the CCS region in mid latitudes. The heavy blue line is an index of warm water krill. It's actually a, the, the difference between warm water krill in the California current system minus cool water krill. And you notice for the first 50 years of this record, up to about 2000, there was a rather um, consistent, consistent relationship between the local Dino index and the, the expression and response of the, um, the krill. However, after 2000, it appears that that relationship began to change. And uh, although there was a response in the strong Nino of 2015-16, it was not uh, commensurate with the responses before. So is there some non-stationarity 
to address, and we're working on the problem. I'm not going to dwell on this. This is merely to illustrate in the variations article. As Manu said, we've tabulated a number of what we think are key uh, species to focus on for, uh, for, the, for trying to quantify responses. And let me just end with this, uh, this reminder of the, uh, the need to differentiate the direct physiological effects, um, the food web effects of reflected in orange, and then the uh, direct propagation effects via advection shown in blue. Great. Thank you very mar much, Mark, for that presentation. And we'll take it to Q&A now as well. So as a reminder, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question over audio, or you can type it into the chat feature. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> <coughs> easy thing to do in a webinar. <laughs> okay, well, we will go ahead and um, just take any questions at the end for Mark as well. Thank you very much. And now I would like to let Antonietta present for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Kristen and Manu, for organizing this webinar. So what we're going to, what I would like to describe is try to outline or uh, examine the mechanism by which ENSO and its diversity can affect the physical environment along the U.S. West Coast, and uh, also discuss some of the implications for predictability. So this is work in collaboration with Chris Karnauskas, Art Miller, and Danish Subramanian. So, uh, Lisa, yes. Chris, uh, we need to have you share your screen with us, please. Oops. You were almost there. <laughs> I almost did. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Can you see me now? We can see you now, and okay. we can see your, your home screen. Thank you. Okay. So anyways, I was saying this is work in collaboration with Chris Karnauska, Art Miller, and Danish Subramanian. So, um, ENSO has a large influence, and we've already heard some from uh, um, in the previous talk, on the um, stratification along the U.S. West Coast, and in particular, key aspects of this influence from a physical viewpoint are the deepening of the thermocline and the warmth of the upper ocean. This is illustrated in this figure for the 1997-98 El Nino, showing sea level and 60-meter temperature at Monterey Harbor. So the sea level is high, is, uh, there is high sea level, which is associated with deeper thermocline, and temperatures are a few degrees warmer than during, um, than relatively to climatology. So uh, these are important effects. So uh, one way by which uh, ENSO can influence the U.S. West Coast is through an oceanic pathway. Uh, so what we see here is the surface height anomaly from altimetry for uh, December 28, 1997. So we have uh, a positive anomaly in the Eastern Pacific and a negative anomaly in the Western Pacific. So this is associated with deeper thermocline in the East and uh, shallower thermocline in the West. This deepening of the thermocline in the Eastern Pacific is uh, a result from uh, a propagation of oceanic downwelling Kelvin waves. And these waves, once they reach the uh, Eastern Ocean boundary, they propagate along the coast. So in the Northern Hemisphere, they propagate northward. And we can see the signal of this wave all the way to Baja California. However, as you can see very nicely from this picture, the offshore scale of the wave decreases with increasing latitude. Also, waves can dissipate due to the rough bathymetry or uh, um, topography. And also, they can lose energy by radiating uh, westward propagating Rossby waves. So it is unclear the, how effective this, mechani this mechanism is to influence the at the stratification in the California current further north. So another way by which ENSO can influence uh, um, the northern North Pacific is through atmospheric teleconnection. And what we can see here is a schematic 
uh, of uh, the canonical wintertime teleconnection pattern, which is, is associated with an El Nino with a warm answer event. This is the Pacific North American pattern, or PNA. And the contours here indicate anomalies of metropospheric geopotential height uh, as a response to this patch of cis the warm sea surface temperature anomaly along the equator. And this, in the North Pacific, this uh, geopotential height anomaly are characterized by a high in the subtropics and the low in the North Pacific. And these features also have a surface uh, signature, and they influence the surface pressure, sea level pressure, and uh, the surface winds. So <clears throat> in the North Pacific, sea level pressure is characterized by this uh, low in the northern part of the basin, the Aleutian low, and there is a high in the uh, eastern subtropics, the subtropical high. And uh, uh, winds associated with this feature are characterized by uh, counterclockwise flow around the Aleutian low and clockwise uh, winds around the subtropical high. So along the um, Pacific, along the U.S. West Coast, we have these northerly winds, which tend to be upwelling uh, favorable winds. So what happens during an ENSO event? So here, these are anomalies of sea level pressure and wind. And this is an example for the 1992-83 and Nino, these are all uh, winter anomalies. So we can see that the Aleutian low tends to strengthen, but also uh, shift further east and south. And there are changes also in the subtropical high. And as a result, this, no, this southerly flow uh, tends to reach further south along uh, the US west coast. So this means that this north, uh, southerly anomaly tends to weaken these uh, uh, upwelling uh, favorable winds along the coast. So this means that the thermocline will, be, um, will become deeper. And, uh, also, uh, the surface heat fluxes may change, so the ocean may lose less heat since the winds are weaker. So these are all uh, effects that are very similar to uh, what the oceanic pathways induces, and so it's very hard uh, to uh, separate the two influences, and it's an active area of research, as we will hear also in the next presentation. So ENSO um, so events have very different expressions. And this is just a collection of uh, uh, winter sea surface temperature anomaly for, uh, for events starting with the 1982-83. So we can see that there are large events like the 1982-83, 97-98, whose anomalies are maximized in the Eastern Pacific. And then we have other weaker events whose uh, sea surface temperature anomaly tend to peak at different longitudes along uh, the equator. And so this, uh, uh, the location of this maximum sea surface temperature anomaly um, varies almost in a continuous fashion. But just for practical purposes, usually these events are grouped in Eastern Pacific or Central Pacific in P, EP and CP to better understand their characteristics and also try to understand their possible impact, the impact of these differences in the spatial pattern. So one uh, way to create this, uh, uh, to group this EP and CP event is just to use uh, um, indices, like the Nino 3 and the Nino 4 indices. So these are the average surface temperature in these red and blue boxes. So uh, in this approach, uh, CP events are um, events that have the largest anomalies in the um, Nino 4 region, which is larger than the corresponding anomaly in the Nino 3, and vice versa for EP events. So we can also consider other regions, so this uh, light uh, pink and uh, light blue, they are just areas displaced 20 degrees to the west relatively to the Nino 3 and the Nino 4 regions, and we can consider the, uh, un the um, characteristics of events that have their maximum anomalies in those regions to just uh, um, illustrate how things change as a function of this uh, quantity. So. Um, in the left panels, in the, uh, here we have uh, uh, an example of thermocline depth anomalies for uh, uh, the soda ocean reanalysis for a CP event and an EP event for events that uh, is largest anomaly in the Nino 3 region and in the Nino 4 region. And uh, in the other panels to the right, uh, we have similar um, analysis for the 
CCSM4 climate model. So we were looking at 500 years of these simulations. We have many more events. So in the central panels, this is the same as the, what we did for soda. And we see that also the, uh, they compare very well. But in this uh, uh, rightmost column, we um, look at the uh, thermocline signature for events that have the largest anomaly in the pink region and the light blue region. And so when uh, um, events that have largest anomaly further west, in particular in this last case, you can see that the thermocline signature becomes weaker and weaker. And the thermocline signature is also associated to upper ocean processes like recharge or discharge of warm water from and to the equatorial thermocline. So there is very little thermocline dynamics in this type of event. So if we go back to the the oceanic pathway that we were describing before, this may imply that uh, um, also the um, Kelvin wave signal, the costally trapped wave signal along the coast may be weaker in, in the case of these uh, Central Pacific events. And this may be the reason. So if we now uh, com compare and contrast the 2015-16 El Nino with the 1997-98, um, the, the two events, although as you can see they have very uh, comparable magnitude, uh, their impact on the uh, U.S. West Coast were very different. So in the second case, the impacts were much weaker, and uh, Mark has alluded to that uh, before in his, one of these last slides. So in this case, the temperature anomaly tend to be shifted toward the west. If we look at the winds, we can see that the zonal winds also tend to be weaker and more confined in the western part of the basin. And the thermocline anomalies are much weaker in the most recent event relatively to the 1997-98. So this may be a possibility for the weaker uh, effect of these events on the uh, US West Coast stratification. So what about? Um, atmospheric teleconnections. So are the atmospheric teleconnections different from different type of events? So we have seen before the example of the 1982-83. We can look at the 1997-98. And we can also consider two CP events, like the 2002-2003 uh, and 2009-2010. So it's hard to see if there is a systematic difference between the um, sea level pressure and surface winds anomaly pattern in these different cases. And in fact, studies that have looked at the atmospheric response using an ensemble of atmospheric model simulation forced by the same ENSO uh, sea, surface sea surface temperature anomaly pattern, um, they see that there is a large spread in the atmospheric response due to internal atmospheric vari variability. So this presence of the noise um, really tend to obscure the influence that different type of events can have. Just for uh, um, curiosity, we can look at these anomalies for the most recent events. So uh, while the Aleutian low deepened, so its southward penetration was much weaker. And so along the US West Coast, the signal was very weak. Or I think in the more southern part, I think there was even a tendency for uh, uh, strengthened upwelling favorable winds. So um, what does this tell us about predictability? So if these different type of events have, can have different, some different effects, either through the oceanic pathways or maybe through the atmospheric, uh, through atmospheric teleconnection, can we predict them? So uh, one way uh, to address this issue is to determine the optimal uh, precursors, for example, um, six months ahead of the event for uh, EP and CP events. And one way to do this is to ask uh, what is the initial state, this x, that uh, will maximize the amplitude of a quantity y uh, after a given uh, time t, uh, that could be six months. Um, and this y characterizes these different states. Could be, for example, the average anomaly in the Far Eastern Pacific, could be the principal component of an EOF pattern. And so this age can be determined through uh, multiple linear regression, and then uh, the uh, initial state can be determined through uh, a singular value decomposition analysis. So we have applied this methodology for these two cases. <coughs> and what we found is that the initial condition in sea surface temperature and thermocline depth uh, at time t equals 0 that will result six months later in a 
Eastern Pacific event are represented here. And this is uh, uh, in the lower panels, we have the same situation for a Central Pacific event. It turned out that in this study that the uh, initial thermocline conditions were very important to pro produce the sense of diversity, to produce different type of events. In particular, for the Eastern Pacific case, the um, initial thermocline condition was deeper than average in the Eastern Pacific, and for the Central Pacific case, the thermocline was shallower than average in the Eastern Pacific. So in the, one, the first case, the zonal thermocline slope was reduced. In the second case, it was actually enhanced. But even if we can uh, predict, uh, so there is some predictability here, potential predictability here. So, but even if we can could predict ENSO perfectly, how well can we predict these uh, um, regional forcing pattern along the U.S. West Coast? So this is the regional forcing pattern that, Mat that uh, Manu was alluding to before. And so uh, perhaps one uh, way to approach the problem is go beyond uh, Eastern versus Central Pacific event, but actually ask the question of what, uh, of what is the tropical Pacific sea surface temperature pattern to which each RPF is more sensi sensitive to. So this uh, problem posed in this way was first uh, um, introduced by Basuli and Sardeshmuk in a paper in 2002. They were, uh, what they did, they forced an atmospheric, uh, they constructed an ensemble of atmospheric model simulation that were forced by little patches of sea surface temperature anomaly along the tropical band. And they tried to determine the pattern that was more um, that the PNA, the Pacific, not, the Pacific North American pattern, and so these are the four uh, center of action was, was most sensitive to. And what they found that the largest sensitivity was these two anomaly that were in the Central Pacific, in fact, in the Nino 4 region. So these two um, black areas here are the uh, um, Nino 3 and Nino 4. And this is very interesting because it may mean that uh, uh, events that have a large projection on this pattern, so even like a, a relatively weak Central Pacific event, can perhaps have a larger influence on this uh, PNA pattern that may be a strong event that is confined to the eastern side of the basin. So we can also we we can also use an approach similar to what described for uh, predicting different type of ENSO event. In this case, we can have our Y can represent uh, one or a combination of this regional forcing pattern, for example, winds, heat fluxes, precipitation, um, thermocline depth, um, and so forth. And then we can determine what is the optimal, what is this op, uh, optimal initial condition that maximizes that uh, uh, the growth of, that maximizes the amplitude of that forcing pattern at some later time. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, uh, conclude here, and uh, the main point that I would like to make, that ENSO has the potential to be a large source of, pred of predictability for the U.S. West Coast marine ecosystems. So, and so events are different, and these differences can be important on the characteristics, on the details of these impacts. Um, in terms of the atmospheric teleconnection, there is a large spread in, uh, in the teleconnection due to atmos internal atmospheric variability, so we are still unclear um, on the detail of how much different spatial pattern of sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific can, can influence that pathway. And I would like to conclude by saying that we really need these novel approaches, perhaps based on the surface temperature sensitivity pattern, to objectively determine the optimal tropical forcing for the U.S. West Coast. So the climate system is a noisy system, and we want to find skillful way of identifying the predictable signal, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonietta. Any questions? Okay, no hands are raised and none in the chat, so we can always come back um, once the presentations are over to address any that come in. Thank you. And let's pass this off now to Mike Taycock. All right, thanks. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Please go ahead and try to share that again. Okay. Now? Yes, we 
see right. the beautiful mountains. So go ahead. Thanks. Oh, can you see a PowerPoint now? Yep, there we go. Great. Slight delay on our end. So. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, work done with co-authors from the newsletter article, Dan Rudnick and Chris Edwards. And basically what I'm going to do is try to provide a link between some of the stuff Mark talked about on the biological side and some of what Antonietta talked about uh, in sort of the basin scale and tropical dynamics um, and quantify some of the physical mechanisms uh, that impart the ENSO influence on the California current system. So here just to set uh, geographical and environmental context, what you're looking at are fields um, that are from a combination of model and remote sensing sources. So on the far left, this is vertical velocity um, taken out of the UC Santa Cruz data assimilative ROMS model, which runs from 1980 to 2010, our reanalysis. So you can see in red, that's upwelling. Um, this is during the upwelling season. So you've got this coastal band of strong upwelling. And that contour that you see is 50 kilometers offshore. Then in the second panel, this is also derived from the model. Um, and this is subsurface nitrate, nitrate concentration at the base of the mixed layer. So you see this nearshore band, again, of high nitrate that fuels productivity and uh, nitrate decreasing as you move out to the oligotrophic subtropical gyre. And then on the right, this is satellite chlorophyll from sea whiffs. So you've got upwelling, bringing nutrients up to the surface, and stimulating growth of phytoplankton, high chlorophyll biomass near the, near the uh, coast. So if you actually look at how these uh, drivers of upwelling and nutrient supply relate to chlorophyll, at least surface chlorophyll, you get a relationship like this. So on the um, x-axis there is wind stress, which drives upwelling. On the y-axis is this, that subsurface nitrate concentration. And then in color and with the contours, that's the surface chlorophyll concentration. So what you get is actually you get this moderate wind stress being optimal for high chlorophyll, where below that wind stress, you have nutrient limitation, just not enough upwelling bringing nutrients to the surface. And when wind stress gets too high, you get these physical processes like offshore advection and subduction that export either chlorophyll or nutrients out of the nearshore zone and limit the chlorophyll uh, biomass that accumulates there. And then you also have this sort of background effect for any given wind stress where higher nitrate in the subsurface water stimulates higher chlorophyll growth. All right, so then thinking about those drivers and their relationship to ENZO, this uh, touches on or sort of reiterates something that um, both Mark and Antonietta have addressed. But these are three key physical metrics in the California current system and how they respond to El Nino events in red and La Nina in blue. This is, again, taken from that UCSC regional model. So you can see there's this relationship with a positive ENSO state um, producing weaker upwelling, lower vertical transport on the left panel deeper uh, isopycnals and um, deeper picnocline, neutrocline in the middle panel there. And then on the right, you end up with kind of a, a derived property, which is the source, the density of the source water. So water that is um, being upwelled, where is it originating from, or what density is it originating from? And that's a proxy for the nutrient supply in there. So you see these. Um, significant relationships with all of these variables, although there is a fair amount of scatter about the fits. But these are sort of the canonical responses. El Nino, weaker upwelling, deeper isopycnals, and nutrient-poor source waters, and the opposite in La Nina. So then we can go one step further and look at what is driving these changes. So this is just a, a sort of simple study where you take a model and you force it with either just the local winds or the remote forcing to see what's doing what. So on the top is a fully realistic run on the left time series of vertical transport, and on the right that nitrate in the subsurface, and I've highlighted the El Nino events in red there. And if you compare that to the model when it's just driven by the wind, that's what you get in blue. So you can see that the vertical transport is largely driven by the wind, as those two time series are almost identical. And there's this uh, trend over 1980 to 2010 that is largely wind-driven as well. And there's a strong effect um, 
of these El Nino events on vertical transport. And then that's also reflected in the subsurface nitrate, where simply if you have strong upwelling, that upwelling is going to draw water up from deeper and with a higher nutrient concentration. Now if we look at the remote forcing, that's what we get in this magenta line. No uh, trend to speak of, but you do get a lot of interannual variability. Actually in the vertical transport, so there is upwelling change that's driven not by the local winds, but by remote forcing through changes to the sea surface height. And also on the right there you get these big changes in the subsurface nitrate. So this would be associated with the wave propagation that Antonietta talked about. And when you take these two together and look at their effects on something like nitrate flux, which is on the y-axis here, the wind and the remote forcing have sort of comparable magnitude of effect. Um, this is off central and northern California, although the relationship's a little tighter with the uh, remote forcing. And then on the right is sort of the fully realistic run. Okay, so to bring that back into this framework of um, bottom-up drivers of productivity, basically, chlorophyll dependence on the environment, we can roughly place El Nino and La Nina in these two places. So El Nino in a low nitrate availability and weaker winds, La Nina in high winds and high nitrate availability. And interestingly, this highlights some sort of maybe non-intuitive mechanisms by which productivity is limited, where in El Nino, even though winds are weaker than normal, sometimes the wind is actually adequate, but you just don't get enough nitrate coming up. And like 1998 was an example of that. In La Nina, these are, you know, productive conditions, but you can actually get winds that are too strong so that the nearshore um, productivity is limited, and that's reflected in uh, the nearshore productivity, but also the high offshore productivity and kind of these uh, habitat expansion that uh, Mark pointed out earlier. Okay, so last I want to get into just how we can go about observing some of these things historically and in, in near real time. So this is the California Underwater Glider Network. This is courtesy of Dan Rudnick. Um, since late 2006, there have been gliders running uh, continuously on these three Cal Coffee lines off Monterey, approximately Point Conception and San Diego. On the right there is a Hobmuller plot of uh, temperature at 50 meters depth, so looking from the coast on the right to 500 kilometers offshore and through time from bottom to top. And you can see starting in mid-2014, uh, these warm anomalies arriving and uh, sticking around through the recent El Nino. This is another uh, similar plot, but in this case we're looking at salinity on a particular isopycnal. So um, what I want to highlight here is in the very top right there is this um, high salinity anomaly that arrived near shore in around the winter of 2015-2016. And since this is on an isopycnal, density doesn't change, so if salinity is going up, that means it's also associated with warmer water. And so this we would think is a, um, a marker of anomalous advection from the south of warm salty water, which Mark also touched on. So then we can also come up with time series for all kinds of relevant physical metrics based on these data, and I won't go through these except to show that they're here and they can be uh, viewed in more detail in the paper referenced at the bottom there. But to take one of them, this is this um, 26.0 isopycnal depth anomaly. Another thing we've been able to do is take these observational networks and then combine them with the models that we have that have the sort of broader spatial and temporal extent and combine them where um, the observations can inform the models and the models can provide a longer historical context for some of the recent observations. So there you have a 30 plus year time series now where we can see multiple uh, ENSO events. And using those combined data, we can look at things like tropical, extratropical connections. So this is looking at the Nino 3.4 index, equatorial SST on the x-axis and its relationship to this one metric of technocline depth on the y-axis. 
and you see a tight relationship, but you also see that some of these standout events fall outside of that relationship. And finally, in terms of predictability, uh, one way of looking at predictability is, is sort of a statistical approach, where on the x-axis now is that, um, again, that picnocline depth in the winter, and on the y-axis is the chlorophyll anomaly in the following spring. So this is this relationship is telling you something about the upwelling season biology and giving you a few months uh, advance to the degree that this relationship holds up. And I've highlighted a couple of years in there to show that there is some skill, but also um, in years like this warm blob of 2014-2015, you fall well outside, so the uh, physical biological connections are not necessarily straightforward. And uh, I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, Mike. And we'll take a few moments here to see if there's any questions. We have a quiet audience today. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, Mike. We're going to go ahead and move on to Clarissa Anderson. Clarissa, are you with us? Yes. Great. You want to go ahead and start sharing your screen, and yep. we'll let you know when we see that come up. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, first thing I want to do is acknowledge my co-authors, who are really uh, the brains behind this newsletter. Samantha Sudlecki uh, from GCO, UW, uh, Cecile Rousseau, who's at NASA Goddard, Brian Powell at University of Hawaii, Chris Edwards at UC Santa Cruz, and Bill Peterson at NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And what we did was try to um, build off of some of the work um, of others like Mike Jaycox. We didn't really get so much into the mechanisms that he was just describing, but really tried to um, illustrate some snapshots of things we know about the biogeochemical and lower trophic level response to ENSO, um, predominantly in the California current system. Um, I think this has already been well covered, but I just here wanted to point out that, of course, there's a, a lot of complexity when it comes to Pacific decadal variability. This is a plot from Manu Di Lorenzo really showing, illustrating this, and the connection that when we're looking at ecosystem response, um, sometimes when we're doing this from sort of a correlative point of view and statistical relationships, we have a hard time teasing out the, the effects of the Pacific decadal oscillation from ENSO and also from NPGO, and they do all, all kind of connect back to the, the variability in the Aleutian low. And as a result of this um, kind of complex teleconnections that we already saw a bit about from Antonietta, there is this memory in the system, and that can lead to a delayed impacts from ENSO um, on the ecosystem. And another point uh, that we kind of illustrated throughout our newsletter was that this time scale of ENSO influence um, is certainly related to the organisms we're talking about here. And, and we're, we're looking at this, this from a food web perspective, but um, in our newsletter, we highlighted it from the biogeochemical point of view and the lower trophic levels, which can respond quickly to changing conditions. Uh, we've got high turnover times or doubling times for phytoplankton on the order of a, a day to a week, and they can certainly respond quickly. Uh, when you're looking at higher trophic levels that are responding or have life history traits and generation times that are more along the lines of the duration and or frequency of ENSO, it becomes more complicated and we start to see more delayed impacts. But, um, you know, Mark also or Mark Oman earlier highlighted that you can have more immediate effects from processes like habitat compression that can certainly affect higher trophic levels on shorter time scales with relationship to El Nino. <coughs> and so we've, we, we, we first mentioned the Northeast Pacific variability in order to um, highlight that we're thinking about these changes in biogeochemistry um, on sort of orders from anywhere from three to 10 years. And when we try to dig down and look at it just from the local or remote effects of, this, of the physical response from, from ENSO in the California current system, it can be a little bit tricky in the literature to find the exact, um, those exact impacts you know, in papers. But we've 
we did our best here, and, and I'm just pointing out what, what Mike has already so nicely illustrated, that there are these three um, strong physical responses that we see here along the, the, the coast of, of, the, of the U.S. West Coast, or I should say the West Coast of North America. And there are changes in surface wind stress that alter the strength of, of upwelling and downwelling. Of course, there's also these remote impacts of coastally trapped waves, these Kelvin waves that propagate poleward up the coast and modify thermocline depths and coastal stratification. And as Mike just showed us, also changes to a longshore advection. And we went through and, and highlighted a, a few things, whoops, sorry about that, from um, carbon dioxide, and that was really more of a um, pelagic northeast Pacific um, discussion, to oxygen. And we thought about oxygen more here, I guess you could say, as um, a biogeochemical impact rather than a driver, I think, which is a little different from maybe how we discussed it at our workshop. Uh, carbonate biogeochemistry, uh, vertical nutrient flux and chlorophyll, down to primary production and particle export, and, and some of these things are then, of course, related to community composition changes that come about as a result of the different differential response to temperature change and other changes in the environment. Um, so with carbon dioxide, uh, there were a few things that we highlighted. One here is the association, pretty strong correlation between uh, PCO2 and the CO2 fugacity to uh, PDO, as well as the multivariate ENSO index. So there does seem to be a connection, certainly out in the um, drier region, to these longer-term variability cycles to the cycles of carbon dioxide. We then turned our attention to nutrients, and here the snapshot was really uh, the recent Frischnick paper that looked at the influence or tried to kind of discern between the local and remote effects of, up well, of, of ENSO in the California current system. And this is not unlike what Mike was just discussing, but this is, is a, this is a different model system than what Mike was showing us. And here they looked at these relative effects and showed that changes in the subsurface ocean are mostly driven by remote forcing and expressed as changes in thermocline along the California coast. And what you'll see here on the plot is that when they looked at the kind of their full composite, which contains the local and remote forcing, and then their, their just their local composite, the local differences don't really, they don't show anomaly patterns comparable to the full composites, uh, which do include the remote forcing, except maybe in the northern California current system. But what you'll see on the right is that the strongest anomalies driven by local processes were found in the vertical velocity plot. And so at least along central and the northern California region, changes in upwelling from El, El Nino are driven by local forcing. And we see these changes reverberating up the, um, up the system here from nitrate to chlorophyll. And so some, Sam, point, um, Sam Sidlecki worked on our, um, the oxygen and hypoxia and ocean acidification component. And she wanted to illustrate here that the bottom oxygen in Oregon um, is correlated with the North Pacific gyre oscillation. So it's got this inner annual variability component. And we see that, too, in California. But we also see this strong relationship between ENSO cycling and pH and oxygen that's on the left plot um, with ENSO. So this is, these are sort of interesting things. They don't get to mechanism per se, but we're starting to get there with some of these biogeochemical components and some of the modeling that, um, that Sam is leading in terms of a lot of this uh, the hypoxia and ocean acidification is really digging down into that mechanism for the California current system. And here is from the blog that uh, Dick Feely maintains. And this is from the Ocean Acidification Program cruises that have been going out and, and surveying the entire coastline here. And you can see that these are surface maps of aragonite saturation and pH. And what they found in this case is that this is the first time they'd seen such corrosive waters at the surface this far south of their, um, during their OAP cruises. And this was during the last El Nino event in May of last year. Uh, there are not many, there really aren't too many studies that are looking directly at the, the primary productivity um, and particle export, but, but Rebecca Scheip, who um, worked on this during her dissertation at UC Santa Barbara, did some really nice work, certainly during the 97-90 El Nino, looking before, during, and after the event at what was happening with suspended particles in the water column and the particle export to sediment traps. And 
did see some interesting changes um, that you've got changes in the composition, the elemental composition of those particles. Um, you do see a, a large drop in the biogen biogenic silica that was in those particles, i.e. the sort of diatom contribution. And so as that's sinking out, of course, you have different remineralization rates in relationship to silicic acid, carbon, nitrogen. And the carbon and nitrate, the, car well, so the, the nitrate is, um, wow, hello, what did I just do? Sorry, guys. The nitrogen is remineralizing pretty quickly, and what you see is that change there in the elemental ratios of those particles. And another point that I think was really important in these papers is that as you move out of the El Nino time period into the La Nina and in the, in the years following, there's really not, it, it does take a long time for those particles to kind of go back to the composition that they had prior to the El Nino. Um, and this might be some of this memory we see where it can take a while for um, the, that response from the suppression of upwell up nutrient flux to, um, I guess, come back such that we have the kind of productivity that we had prior to the El Nino. And these changes in the environment, the thermocline depth, temperature, they're all going to lead to some kind of change in, in species composition, and we see this in, across the plankton, from phytoplankton to zooplankton. And in the case of phytoplankton, this can manifest as, a, as a, an increase in harmful algal blooms. And a recent paper here by uh, McCabe and others illustrates that there is a connection between, or, or could potentially be a connection between the growth potential of Pseudonychia and these warming events. And this comes back to those uh, growth temperature curves that Mark Oman showed earlier, where Pseudonychia has an optimal temperature, and it does seem to um, work or coincide well with the kind of temperature regimes we see in the California current system during El Nino. And so there is a pretty nice correlation, at least between what that potential growth rate anomaly could be for Sotonichia based on these growth rate curves and the ONI. And this seems to also align fairly well with the, the toxicity, the domoic acid toxicity in razor clams over this time scale off the Oregon coast. And what they saw here was that it wasn't always perfectly aligned. Um, you can see that in the 97 event, for instance, the razor clam toxicity is not necessarily being driven or forced by this event. But there does seem to be enough of a correlation that we might be able to derive some predictability from this. And finally, I'll just finish with the zooplankton. Um, you know, there have been many papers that have shown this over the years, and Bill Peterson is, is continuing this time series and continuing to, um, to show us just how much of an effect these events have on the anomalies related to the northern copepod, these colder species of copepods, and the southern warm species um, assemblage of copepods, and how these change over time in relation to these longer term um, climate oscillations, PDO and El Nino. And so this is really obviously the, the work of many people, but we're, um, we just highlight this part to end our, our snapshot, really, this, this go through this blitzkrieg of many things that are going on in the ecosystem. And I think we're a bit of a kind of a long ways in some of these things at looking at mechanism, but if we can start to merge what Mike was showing earlier with in the California current system in terms of really defining what the local and remote forcings are then the, and, the, and the mechanisms that are leading to these things, we'll be able to build these into the models and have a lot more predictability. So with that, I will just thank everyone, the, the Clivar team that brought us together and say thank you for a successful workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. And we'll take, again, a few moments here, see if there's any questions that came in um, for Kularsa. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, please, go ahead. What is the optimal temperature for the growth of, uh, of the algal, uh, harmful algal blooms? Mm, what was the temperature that they come up with? Um, I would say it was, it was probably close to 15, since <laughs> it's so common for so many phytoplankton, but I, I can't remember. It might have actually been closer to 20. I'll have to look it up again because I don't remember, and I don't, we don't have it built into um, our statistical models just yet. But um, 
And that was just for one species, too, in a lab, so it could be very highly variable for some of the, the species of Pseudonychia. And that growth curve you showed uh, for the Pseudonychia, is, is, that, um, so is that curve been diagnosed uh, with uh, physical processes uh, in the Mate paper? No, not so, so much. I mean, they, they certainly looked at, the, they looked at this in the context of the Pacific Warm Anomaly, and um, and when when it was all along shore there, they they had some correlations then between the temperature that was happening there. But but in terms of the mechanism, there was a lot happening in the thermocline, and there were there were large changes in, in the nutrient regime at that time too. So I think it's I think you could you could make the argument that it's um, it's a temperature nutrient relationship that's really um, driving things. But it might be that you could reduce it to temperature over certain time scales and have some predictability there. I was just thinking that this could be a great target for an example proof of concept of using uh, Mike's uh, kind of um, uh, plot between nutrients, winds, and maybe include also the sea surface temperature as a third variable and try to diagnose uh, in which part of the phase space the growth of the Sudonicha lives. And, and that would be, I think, very interesting. Oh, yes, we wrote that proposal to NASA last winter and it didn't get funded. Um, well, you know, We'll write a paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will. If, if I might chime in for a moment, Mark here, um, outbreak of, of HABs is pretty far from my expertise, but uh, we certainly need to consider the dimensions of not only temperature, but the nutrient composition that Clarissa was alluding to. The, um, whether the nitrogen is in the form of urea, ammonium, or other sources is important, and then iron limitation is also important. So I'd, it's a multi-dimensional issue. Thank you, Mark. Very true. All righty. Thanks, Clarissa. I don't see any other hands at the moment, so let's go on to Elliot. And if I can get you to, yes, go ahead. If you can do the green arrow, perfect. Hello, hopefully you guys can see my presentation. Yes, and it's loading, thank you. Great, um, so I like to start with this animation because it's showing just on the left a um, NASA sea surface temperature video that of a, basically a La Nina developing in the tropics. But just to remind folks, in the top right, I actually have SST on the background here with a tagged bluefin tuna migrating north-south in the California current. And to make the point that we know a lot about the dynamic oceanography in many cases, and we're learning more about the dynamic ecosystems and their response. So this is a talk that part of, the, again, one of these variations articles that myself, Mike Alexander, Stephen Bograd, Alistair Hobde, Ryan Rikoshevsky, and Kylie Scales put together. So one of the things that we are, I would say, a little behind in the U.S., um, especially compared to Alistair Hobde and his group in Australia, is this concept of being able to manage at multiple time scales. We know that decisions are made from you know, daily time steps, when there's extreme weather that might stop a boat from going out fishing, all the way to decades and centuries if you're putting in a marine protected area and you want to make sure that it's going to be resilient to climate change. Um, but these different approaches require different levels of forecasting and different levels of models to be able to give you the warning time you need, um, a reactive approach, early windows for implementation, you know, longer term thinking so you can determine how much you might invest in a certain fishery over another or a certain gear type over another, and then this kind of long term planning policy relevant. But we're often stuck really at the days, weeks to months, and often the year stage just because that's often where most of our management activities happen in the U.S. Still focusing a bit on Australia here, this is an example of these multiple scales where there is a now cast on the left in Dark blue is an area where you can fish for yellowfin tuna. In green, you can fish for yellowfin tuna if you have a quota for bluefin tuna as bycatch. And then yellow are areas where you don't fish at all um, either way. So this is updated on a ROMS model um, for the now cast. A two-week forecast is also used to give the fishermen an idea of whether they should be going out over the next few weeks. And then they also have a two-month forecast that's actually used for determining the start date of the fishery. So these various predictive products can all be used to make different decisions, um, specifically targeting this yellowfin tuna um, fishery. And what, this, what we've kind of called this approach is dynamic ocean management. And the reason it's particularly valuable is that it is responding directly to the scales relevant both for the animal movement 
as a function of their environment, and human uses. So you'll have some sort of physical feature, things like a front. This is just showing sea surface temperature, and you can really see the upwelling plume here. You'll have some sort of data on animal use. In this case, this is telemetry data from the Tagging and Pacific Predators project. And then you'll have some sort of data on threats, and this can be things from fishing threats to climate threats and you know, other marine spatial planning approaches. The goal being that you put these together in a tool that can predict overlaps in near real time. So this can be updated on daily time steps if you have the satellite data or the model products coming in, or also can be done you know, using a forecasting approach if you have the, something like the NMME models that were discussed earlier. Again, in Australia, they, they've actually implemented this in a mandatory framework, but most of the examples in the U.S. are voluntary. And part of the reason why this is particularly important for the California Current, you've already seen this slide, thanks to Mark, but it points out the issue where you have this compression, essentially, of forage in these El Nino years, where they're closer to the shore compared to the 1999 La Nina. And while we don't often have prey at the scales that we would like to be able to understand top predator response to ENSO events, we can use a lot of the physical variables as proxies, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit about next. So I wanted to walk through a specific case study that a number of the co-authors are working on right now, which is the California drift gillnet fishery right here off of our coast, for those of us here in California at least. And there is a large seasonal closure that was put into place between around 213,000 or 230,000 in this figure square miles from a large part of the fishing season to protect these endangered, critically endangered Pacific leatherback sea turtles. And that box was essentially drawn based on the figure in the middle here where you can see the bycatch events. And so a very large closure has actually had quite a bit of management success. The top right is showing tracking data from leatherback turtles to show kind of where their hotspots are, highlighting that there are some hotspots off the coast of Washington as well that are, might even be a little bit outside of this uh, Pacific leatherback conservation area. The problem with this large closure is that the, it was actually imposed a pretty large economic cost on the fishery, and the number of licenses went from about 75 in 2000 to uh, less, right now we're at around 10, if not less than 10. So the goal is, can we come up with a tool that both maximizes conservation but also minimizes economic um, cost to the fishery? There's also another closure I'll just mention quickly, this loggerhead closure in the bottom right in the bite during El Nino events. So when there is an El Nino event forecast in the tropics, they have a rule that will close the fishery in this box. And so one of our goals also is to come up with more local metrics other than just the ENSO metrics in the tropics, since we've heard a few talks that not every ENSO is the same, or not every El Nino is the same. So the data sets we're using, we have tracking data on the left, things like leatherback sea turtles, sea lions, blue sharks in red, orange, and blue, um, consequently. And then also we have catch data from observer records, things like blue sharks, and then the target catch species swordfish. Because if you simply are closing where bycatch areas are highest, you might be also closing some of these areas of important kind of fisheries yield. So the goal is to look at these things in concert. So I'm skipping over a lot of the meat, but please read the article if you're interested in that or um, some of the impending papers we have coming. But we're using statistical models to relate the species distributions to the environment. And you can then see how, in a regular fishing season, patterns of swordfish catch, California sea lion habitat use, leatherback turtle habitat use, and then both blue shark tracking data from the tags and observer data are changing throughout the fishing season. So these patterns of change then can be used to combine to come up with areas of high catch risk, low bycatch risk, and low catch high bycatch risk to direct the fishery. And one of the tools, one of the ways this was particularly useful is we were able to essentially assess how good a job the California drift gillnet, um, sorry, the Pacific leatherback closure area is doing in protecting these leatherback sea turtles. So we were able to sum up the number of total turtle days where turtle habitat was predicted and looked at that for the 2012 fishing season compared to the 2015 fishing season. And what it shows is that for 2012, an average year, the static closure, again, even though it's pretty large economic cost, was very successful, um, or is very successful in, predict, in protecting potential leatherback turtle habitat. However, in 2015, in this kind of strange warm blob and El Nino year, we see that there actually are a lot of areas in blue outside of 
the PLCA that are predicted to be important turtle habitat as well. So having either a more dynamic tool that tracks these features, or even if we use that dynamic tool to kind of assess current spatial closures, we can do a better job improving the efficacy and timing of these seasonal closures. And I should have mentioned here in blue, these are essentially one means if you had a value of dark blue, it would say that all 120 days of the fishing, or 121 days of the fishing season we were looking at were predicted to be important leatherback turtle habitat for that grid cell. So you can really see how that changes. And then values of negative one were those that were predicted to be less. And just to kind of give a little bit of a preview as to where we're going, we're using this model not just for assessing the past utility of the PLCA, but also for creating this real-time product. So we can look at exactly where bycatch on the left is predicted to be highest, and then where this combined target catch in with um, the target species in blue, and then the bycatch in red on the right um, is essentially changing in space and time. And you can really see some of these kind of mesoscale features coming out as some of the important factors in our models. But we hope to have this tool online that essentially is offering us a climate-ready approach that can react both to ENSO events and also to um, long-term kind of decadal change and still allow for spatial closures as needed while keeping open the important fishing habitat. So I think that is all that I have. Thanks, Elliot. Um, nice way to bring this up to an applications management perspective here to wrap up our presentation. Uh, we do have time for questions, so if you, anyone has questions for Elliot or any of our other presenters, uh, please go ahead and ask those at this time. Um, you can either raise your hand and we can take you off mute or you can type them into the